Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Welcome to today's session, Ministering Divine Healing, Session 1. Thank you all for joining in. Good to see you. Sid, Anita, Roslyn, Leah. I hope you all are doing well. And I hope you can all hear me well. Yes. Is my voice all clear? Yes, yes it's clear. <clears throat> Yeah, you guys can hear me, right? Okay. Yes, Pastor, we can hear you. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's pray and we'll get started. All right. <clears throat> Father, we, we come before you unto your throne of grace, Lord. Father, thank you, Lord, that uh, you're so good, you're so full of mercy, you're so full of kindness and compassion towards us, your children, Lord. Lord, we thank you that every new day is filled with new mercies, Lord. And so, Father, we submit this time into your hands as we learn uh, on ministering divine healing. Father, I pray that our eyes will be opened uh, to, the, to, to your heart, Father. That, that, that we would get a glimpse of how you loved people and how much you still love people. And that you want to see them well and whole and complete. So as we learn from your word, Holy Spirit, minister to us, you teach us and uh, Lord, help us to be sensitive. Pour out your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding over us as we learn more about you from you. I submit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. All right. Um, well, trust you all are doing well. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and we get started. can um, see my screen. Um, I just want to, uh, as we always do, want to do a quick run through of, a ch of chapter three, uh, which we covered uh, in the last class last week. Um, chapter titled, uh, The Father's Works. Okay, so to do a quick recap, we see that the Lord Jesus came to do the works of the Father. Right? Because he came to do the works of the Father, so we are called, the you and I, you and I, as his children, as his heirs to the kingdom, we are called to do the works of the Father, just like Jesus. And so when we say just like Jesus, how did he go about doing this? Okay, we see that uh, Jesus taught about the Father's work. He said that uh, every time his uh, divinity or, or deity was questioned, he would refer or point towards the miracles that he performed. Okay, so you'd say, believe in me because you see the works I am doing. And they bear a greater witness than John the Baptist. Right? It was a very strong statement that Jesus makes, isn't it? Uh, and when, even when the prophet himself, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, who John the Baptist is known as, uh, even when he doubts, when he has a doubt, uh, you know, Jesus tells his disciples to go and tell John, tell him that the blind see the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. Once again, Jesus pointing to the works that he was performing, that he did, right? Uh, to prove that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. He is the Lamb that has come, right? Um, and then Jesus, time and time again, he says, I must do the Father's work. And we see that uh, how, how, how much that Jesus expresses his love for the Father, and then vice versa, how the father expresses his love and his acceptance uh, about his son, Jesus. Right? So the, uh, 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 as we just mentioned, the works I do bear witness of me. Right? In John 10, uh, 37, he says, if I, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. Once again, a very bold uh, you know, uh, statement 
to make. If I if I do not do the works, not just works, but any works, but the works of my father, that if I'm not in, if I'm not obedient to his works, don't believe in it. Right. Um, so that's what uh, we saw in the last chapter. Uh, let's move on. And so time and time again, uh, we see that how intimately that Jesus walked with the Father in obedience, right, in, uh, in, in his intimate presence. And everything that Jesus did and said was what he saw the Father do and speak, right? Um, so that was a very in briefly a gist of what, of what chapter 3 was all about, right, the works of the Father. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, that you have the time uh, to go back and reread that chapter. And I pray, uh, you know, I hope you know, that you uh, that you were encouraged as you went through the chapter again, because we are all called to press in, you know, just as Jesus, uh, you know, did the Father's work. Works. We are called to do the works of the Father. Amen. Uh, are you guys with me so far? Okay. Uh, I hope you are learning, and I hope you are, uh, you know, I, I do understand, uh, and I also realize, don't get me wrong, that the content uh, can be heavy. Uh, it's it's rich, uh, hence it's heavy, okay? So, and it may take some time to digest and, you know, uh, fathom, except whatever. Um, but that's the beauty of it, right? When we are learning something beautiful about a, a God and how he lived and his heart for people, and that is you and I, and his His heart to work with us. He doesn't have to, right? He can be his God, isn't it? And he can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do. But instead, he chooses to partner with us. He wants to hold our hands and work with us. He wants us to reveal who he is, his love for the world, right? to reveal the Father's love for an orphan world that is just going away, uh, you know, thinking everything that it is doing is right. Uh, right. So uh, just as we go through this course, uh, you know, even if the content is a little heavy and whatnot, uh, be encouraged. Uh, don't give up. Don't lose uh, heart um, thinking, like, oh, this is just too much for me. Uh, and whatnot, um, but just press in, okay? Uh, press in, press in. It's it's for this is made available for you, uh, you and I. All right. Um, okay, so it's, it's enough prep talk, I guess. <laughs> uh, now we're going to look at chapter four uh, today. Okay, and we're going to start with chapter four: uh, learning to minister healing and deliverance from Jesus. It's an awesome title, isn't it? Learning to minister healing and deliverance from Jesus. Uh, wow. Uh, okay, so in this chapter, basically, what we're going to do is a pastor is going to uh, you know, cover seven principles. Okay, seven principles uh, when ministering healing and deliverance. Okay, so uh, the five of which is inspired by a sermon. Uh, called the thrill of victory. Okay, the thrill of victory. Okay, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Randy Clark. Um, he uh, he leads this ministry called the Global Awakening, and uh, who is known very popular for his healing ministry. And he travels around the world, uh, you know, hosting uh, healing crusades and meetings uh, and teaching about healing and deliverance uh, as well. So uh, five of the seven principles have was inspired by his from his son, and then there are two more points that's been added uh, to. Okay, um, so in this chapter we will cover what are those seven principles, right? Um, one is the will of God, the exercise of faith, the flow of compassion, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, dealing with the issue of sin and salvation the methods Jesus used, and the nature of Jesus' healings and miracles. Okay? And if we have time, we'll go into chapter 5 as well later on today. So uh, basically, this is what we're going to uh, try and cover uh, today. Right? Um, you guys looking forward to it? You guys looking forward to learning something new today? Okay, 
I'll take that as a yes. Um, you know, when I used to study music, um, if when my sir used to teach, right, um, just to make the class interesting, and if no one in the class responded, he would say yes, no, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to imagine and pretend that I can see your heads nod, whichever way it wants to know. But, uh, okay. So, um, before we uh, start learning about the principles in which uh, and how we can minister healing and deliverance, we just take a little, uh, try and build a foundation of, uh, you know, of how these principles function. Okay, so we are going to call these principles norms okay normal okay where normal comes from it's a normal thing it's a norm right so what is it um we walk in the truth we have and work with what we do know we refer to these as norms okay uh, we walk in the truth we have and work with what we do know what we know and what with, with what we have we work with that when you do when you work with that that is no, that's the normal thing to do, right? Um, so these are the principles that we see in God's word. Okay, everything actually what we've covered so far, especially in chapter one and chapter two, uh, we, we see a lot about God's principles already established, right? Um, and so we work with what we know and what's been revealed to us, okay? However, we must also keep, always keep in mind that God is bigger than our understanding and bigger than our present knowledge of him and bigger than all our cumulative knowledge. Okay, So there will always be a situation where God surprises us. We will call these exceptions. Okay? So there are, there is a uh, for, uh, for, our, for the sake of our understanding, there is a set of rules that God always functions, always chooses to function, but then that there are times where God chooses to work outside of those guidelines, of those principles, because he is God and he is sovereign, right? Um, and so for just to first sake of understanding a little better, um, uh, I apologize for taking an example of music because that's kind of, kind of a stream I understand a little better. And I think of another example if I can come up with something. So if you know anything about music, let's take, for example, a C major scale. C major scale has a set or a series of seven notes in it, right? Um, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Okay the principle or the rule or the guideline says if you are composing a song or writing a melody choosing a c major scale you can only use these set of notes right c d e f g a b okay now that's the principle that's the given you, and it's from, it's from that C major scale, you get uh, also known as the diatonic chords or the family chords, which is C major, F major, G major, and the three minor chords, D minor, E minor, A minor. They all belong to that principle, that box, okay? What we're trying to understand, right? That's the norm. That's the normal thing. Now, and then comes a composer into the picture. It's like, hey, you know what? I'm going to do try and do something different. I'm going to try and add a chord that does not fit, that does not come uh, in, in, in the C major family uh, and make it more colorful or, or, or whatever, right? So those are the exceptions, right? Are you guys with me? I hope you were able to get something of what I'm trying to say, okay? Uh, because composer, like I'm the composer, uh, I can do what I want to do. Right? The, that's the kind of attitude, right? Um, and, and we kind of see that in, um, let's take another example. Let's, say, uh, let's take food, for example, right? Food. Um, let's take a popular uh, dish that everybody in the world might know. Um, I don't want to talk about, uh, okay, fine. Okay, let's talk about biryani, okay? Because India. Indian, I mean, sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so, 
biryani is a well known dish in india isn't it guys um so much so we have so many different regions and each region or each state is known for the way they make biryani right uh you go to hyderabad and you you talk with any of them from there they will talk like that you know it's like hey this is the land of biryani okay everything else is not biryani okay these are the ingredients this is how you should do it this is the principle this is the method okay everything else uh uh-uh. uh don't even talk about it right and then uh, people from uh, kashmir come into the picture and say like wait okay you think biryani is all spicy you know we we choose to put apples in it <laughs> uh yeah anyway so you know it's like a chef you know i'm the chef i will choose whatever i want to do i will put whatever i want to do to it right um so it's the exceptions I, i is anybody getting an idea of what we're talking about here right um italians uh pizza pizza is from italy isn't it it's it's a uh, it's their dish right um cheese basil and tomato just these three things make the original pizza right and then what happened pizza went to america and then all kinds of things happened there and then what happened finally pizza came to india we put chicken tikka masala on, on pizza and said okay hey you know i know that's the principle but we're going to do what we're going to do with it okay why because we can call the shots isn't it so that's basically what's happening here is we have this set of rules and this set of that rules the rules is a very harsh and a yeah almost a negative uh, feel to it but uh, we have a set of principles and uh, you know we are going to study about these seven principles and time and time again we will see that how god chooses to function through those principles most of the time and then also because he is god and he is sovereign he will choose to function and move out of those principles but he is not always only dependent on those principles okay so that's what we're going to learn uh today all right uh, so the first principle that we see uh is the will of god how many times have we covered uh this uh you know so far in this course right time and time again we have spoken about the will of god about his desire to heal people so there is no negotiation there is no debate that we need to have or some sort of an argument that we need to have okay is it god's will to heal people like time and time again we've seen that uh you know that it is his will to heal people it is his will and so therefore in the previous chapter we also see we don't even really have to pray that it's like lord if it is your will let this person be healed because we never say that when a person wants to be saved when we give an altar call we don't say lord if it's your will let this person be saved it's like then what's the point of the cross kind of thing you know uh we do so we eliminated that question so he eliminated any question about god's will through what he said and did okay jesus eliminated any question about god's will through what he said and did remember uh, we are talking up in this chapter it's titled uh, learning okay we are we are learning that means you and i are learning to minister healing and deliverance from jesus his life and what he went about doing, okay so that's the will of god right the first thing we see an example here uh, is that when you know a leper comes to him and says okay if it is your will right if it is your will if you are willing you can make me clean and jesus a simple response was i am willing be cleansed okay so time and time again uh, we see that okay he comes to jesus is like and he asks lord if it is your will let me be healed um and this is just one of the examples with everything that we've covered uh, you know so far in the class isn't it time and time again we see that jesus came to reveal the love of the father uh his true will that you know what we lost in the fall we strayed away from the original design right but it is his will that that he wants and he loves to see his children be made whole like the original design okay so he eliminated any question it's, it's out of the equation right uh the rock solid let's get it into our heads into our systems and our hearts that he is good and it is his will 
to heal. Okay, that's clear, right? And then we see that he demonstrated that God's will is to heal all who came to him in faith. Right? He demonstrated God's will. How? When all who came to him in faith. Right? There's so many scriptures that talk about this, okay? That support that statement, um, that above statement. And you can read all of this. We are not going to go through it all because most of it we've already gone through. And uh, once again, I would encourage you, uh, you know, to read those scriptures. Uh, and reading scriptures, I mean, it's never a waste of time, right, guys? So, uh, just uh, encourage yourself, motivate yourself to go uh, and read those scriptures. Okay, so Jesus demonstrated God's will is to heal all who came to him in faith, right? He never sent anyone away with any reason, uh, saying, okay, it's not happening, etc. Okay, so those are the two principal functions. So it is his will, and he healed all who came to him in faith. Okay, but then... So that's the norm, remember? That's, those are the norms. And then we see the exception. Yet Jesus did not heal at random. Right? Um, while the Lord Jesus healed all who came to him in faith, he did not force healing on people. But there is this exception. Okay, so we see uh, at the pool of Bethesda, there was a crippled man. We all know the story. And he was crippled for 38 years. Okay, um, so can we all just go to John chapter 5, please? Let's all go to John chapter 5. And uh, let's just uh, you know, go through that scripture. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read it for us. John chapter 5. Verse one to nine. Actually, uh, can uh, one of uh, one of you all read for the class, please? John chapter five, verse one to nine. Okay, someone. John chapter five, verse one to nine. Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which is a Ramite. It's called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid person replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cute. He picked up his mat and walked. Amen. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, um, so we are very familiar with this passage. We know uh, this, right? But uh, why is this an exception? Because when you read the verse 3, when we take a look at verse 3 again, uh, here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. Okay, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Okay, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Um, and there's a... There's a footnote there at the bottom. It says some less important. Um, some less important people. Okay. Um, and so, when we see here, like, hey, Jesus, what, you know, the obvious question uh, everyone and normally we can tend to have is that what about those great number of disabled people there? Great number, right? And we don't necessarily know how many, uh, but we can assume that there were a lot and a lot of people, right? And uh, and so Jesus comes to just this one man and he asks him, "Are you willing to be healed?" And his his response also is not very clear. Is like, "There is nobody to put me into the pool when the waters are stirred," um, and so. Why did Jesus 
heal this man. Okay. Why did Jesus not go to everyone else beside the pool and heal them? Okay. And so we see that it's been it's explained in in five uh, in John chapter five verse seventeen to twenty. Um, let's uh, let's give that a read. Okay. So verse 17 to 20, John chapter 5, this is what it says. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews uh, tried all the harder to kill him. Not only uh, was he breaking the Sabbath. Okay, uh, let's come to verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son cannot do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing. Because what, whatever the father does, the son also does. Right? Whatever the father does, the son also does. And verse 20 says, For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Okay. So, um, it's kind of made, made my clear there that Jesus explained that, you know, he did what he saw the father do. Nothing more, nothing less, uh, you know, and nothing else as it's mentioned. Okay, so this is the exception. The norm would be uh, for each of them to come and receive by faith. Okay, that's the norm. That's the principle. That's what is expected, right? For, for each of them to come and receive by faith. Like the rest of the crowds, okay, we saw uh, in all of this, in how the crowds came to Jesus in faith, right? As we go on in the next principle, uh, other principles, we'll see a lot more examples of that, but that's the norm. And then there are times when, you know, when he's, he chooses to step out of the norm because he is God and he would do what the Father tells him to do or what the Father has shown him to do, okay? So, uh so that's, uh, so that's the ex ex uh, an example of an exception. Um, so let's look at some of the applications here, okay, from the first principle of what we've covered. When people are unsure about the will of God, we bring them to a place where they know that it is God's will to heal, okay? When people are unsure about the will of God, we bring them, okay? In other words, we preach or we teach about the will of God. Okay, that it is God's will for them to be healed. We, we, you know, we, we put that seed into their hearts. Okay, it is God's will to heal everyone, and so we pray and minister to everyone. Okay, because we know that it is His will to heal everyone, we pray and minister to everyone. Yet, we do not we do not go about randomly or arbitrarily ministering to people, especially when they do not desire healing. Okay, and this is where. Okay, this is where following the leading of the Holy Spirit and being sensitive to the leading of his voice comes into the picture. And all of that is developed in our intimacy with the Lord. Okay, we are tuned in to see what the Father is doing at any moment and do what he is revealing to us. We are tuned in. Okay, it simply means we have to be sensitive, tuned in, right? We tune in what? What does a radio do, okay, of frequency? We, we are in the right frequency with, with what God is, uh, you know, speaking, what he's uh, sharing, what he is showing, what he's revealing to us. And it is so important for us to move, uh, you know, in, the, in that sensitivity. Okay, so that's the first principle. What is the first principle? It is God's will to heal everyone who comes to him in faith. And yet it doesn't put him in a box. He will choose to move. Right, and it is important for. Therefore, it is important for us to be sensitive to what God is doing. Okay. Um, now, going on to the second principle, the exercise of faith. Exercise of faith. Okay. Faith and compassion are probably are possibly the two most important principles in healing ministry. Okay, faith and compassion. So the previous principle is linked to the second principle. Okay, the exercise of Faith. Now we know about faith, okay? Uh, we've uh, developed a heart of faith because we've been taught and we've, we've heard that, okay, it is God's will. Now, 
we need to act on it. We need to work, exercise on it, right? We need to bring that into fruition. That's why we exercise, okay? Uh, it's like we, we have this blank check uh, in our hands and do nothing about it, okay? We have this absolute gift, like uh, the greatest deal of our lives, which is not even fair in so many levels. Um, we have it and we choose not to deposit it. It's like, and we just, you know, frame it and put it on our wall and say, wow, you know, we have this blank check and do nothing about it. It is useless. It's worthless, like hanging on a wall with a frame, isn't it? Right? It, 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 it shows its worth only when you deposit it into a bank. Okay? So that's the exercise that, uh, of faith. That's what is revealed in this principle. Okay? Um, and the examples used here, uh, you know, where the Roman centurion, for example, who comes to him in faith, right? Uh, the choice of words that he uses are incredible, right? When you read his story in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 7, uh, what does he say, right? He's a Gentile, remember that, right? He's a Roman centurion, he's not a Jew. He comes to him and he says, well, his daughter needs to be healed. And then Jesus says, uh, you know, I got stuff to do. But then he's like, I know I myself as a man of authority, the power my word carries. Because I'm a man of authority, when I say something, people obey. And so, and he recognizes the authority that Jesus carries and say, he only says, release your word. And then Jesus responds, you know, uh, your, your faith is great, for your daughter is healed. Isn't it? And similarly, all of these examples are taken from there, okay? Where Jesus honors and acknowledges people's faith. And he moves, he responds by healing them. Okay? Um, so... Uh, Having said all of that, the exception here, as once again, we see that is, uh, you know, unbelief stopped the flow of God's power. Unbelief is the opposite of faith, isn't it? It's, it, it kind of ridicules faith. It demeans faith. Okay? Unbelief is almost like this condescending attitude. Uh, it's like, I know better or seriously. Come on, you know, um, it's so much in, it's so close to pride. Okay, so it's like borderline pride there, or almost pride. Okay, but, um, and so we see that unbelief stopped Jesus uh, from, you know, from going about performing miracles. Right? But yet, once again, as an example, as an exception, uh, you know, we have this example of uh, the man of the pool of Bethsaida, which we just uh, read in John chapter 5. It's like, what faith did he have? Right? He didn't have any faith. Right? His response even <laughs> didn't show off any faith. Uh, like, even his response, like we just saw, that when Jesus asks him, do you want to be healed? He's like, yeah, but then nobody is there to you know, put me into the pool. Uh, you know, so the answer was also confused, not, you know, but even so, Jesus heals him, right? Um, the man also who is, uh, um, um, so Mark chapter 9, verse 17 to 29, you also see that example in Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, uh, you know, there's a man who, whose son is, uh, is, is oppressed, is almost a lunatic. Um, he's already encountered the disciples of Jesus, right? Je the disciples of Jesus have tried praying for him. Uh, it hasn't worked. And so they come to Jesus uh, and, and Jesus kind of gives a look at his disciples as like you people of little faith. Um, and, you know, and it's very interesting what this man responds, the father of the son. He says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Right? Help my unbelief. Uh, you know, 
And once again, you know, Jesus is moved by that and as an exception. So he, his son is healed. Okay, so uh, exercise of faith is crucial in ministering uh, healing and deliverance. We do our part. That is the norm. That's the principal thing. Okay, it's the right thing to do. Okay, we function and we leave the rest to God. Okay, you do what you can do. You move in faith. You step out and take the risk. And then you leave the rest to God. Okay. Um, so the application part of here we see is that we minister and receive healing with faith in our hearts. Okay. Faith is based on the word of God, as we see it in Romans 10, 17, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God, right? Faith is present tense. So act now. Okay. There are times when God moves supernaturally through the gifts of healings or the workings of miracles where either the recipient or the minister or sometimes both are not in any great level of faith. Okay, now think about it. You go to a, uh, you know, you go to a house uh, where someone's passed away or some, someone is dead uh, and you, you are praying uh, for resurrection. You're praying for that person to come alive again, right? The person who is dead has no, where, where is the faith in that equation, right? Has no faith. Uh, you know, we, are, we take that risk and we pray for that person to be raised from the dead, or whatnot, right? Uh, but the, there are also situations where the minister who is praying also has no faith and the person who is being prayed for also has no faith. Um, have, you been, uh, have you ever been in a situation? I have, right? But that, does that limit God? It does not. Okay. Um, there, so there are times when all you have is a mustard seed of faith. Start with that and God will honor that faith. How does he honor? Why is Abraham known as the father of faith? He was obedient and he stepped out. Right? He was obedient and he stepped out. Although everything was not clear. It's like, okay, you know what? You said this. I'm going to cling on to that. I'm going to hold on to that. Um, and then I'm going to step out. Okay. So therefore, step out and minister to people, even when you don't sense a great level of faith in yourself or in the people being ministered to. Right. This is, uh, this is where our ministry is tested. Right. This is where uh, our trust and our obedience uh, you know, what we believe in is also being tested, isn't it? Um, so I want to encourage you uh, with this point that, you know, most of you are already in a place of leadership. Uh, you are already pastors and ministering in a place, and some of you will eventually be in that place. Or some of you, you don't have to be in a full-time ministry, as we call it, but your, your place of ministry can be your workplace or the school as a teacher or, or wherever, a manager, a team leader, in the, in the corporate setting. Okay, um, step out in faith. Okay, it doesn't matter if you don't have, you don't be, fully believe it or not, but just put your trust in God. Okay, simply because God is willing. That is his heart. And so you respond in faith. Exercise your faith. Right, you guys with me so far? Okay. Uh, to the third principle we move on, we see uh, the flow of compassion. The flow of compassion. In the second point, we saw that uh, faith and compassion are two key uh, you know, principles when we are moving in healing and deliverance, right? Faith and compassion. Um, so, and how many times do we see that, uh, you know, it talks about Jesus being moved with compassion? Okay, so the Lord Jesus ministered out of deep compassion for people. Okay, uh, it's two different words, right? Compassion, okay. There's passion, and then come. So you come with passion, okay? And um, so very quickly, guys, yes, oh, oh, you know, when you hear the word passion, uh, what comes to your mind? What is your understanding or your interpretation of the word passion?
Okay, you can uh, type your answers. You can on the chat section. Uh, feel free to unmute and speak as a share as well. When you hear the word passion, what comes to your mind? Zeal and intense desire. Yeah. Okay. Zeal and intense desire. Thanks, John. Anybody else? Subhashish? Uh, Jafina, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just want to say sincerity, like you never want to give up on that. Sincerity, okay. Is that right, Jafina? Did I get that right? Sincerity? Yes, like you just never want to give up on that, no matter how many struggle, yeah. you never want to give up. That's passion. You never want to give up, okay. Awesome, thank you. And Zelito, you mentioned strong desire. Thank you, Zelito. Uh, what else, guys? Um, powerful or compelling emotion, right? Powerful or compelling emotion. Oh, wow. okay. Anita, anyone? Subhashesh? Ruben? Nikki? Compassion. Passion. Aradhana. Swami. Collins. Sid, what do you think? Rosalind, passion, passion, passion. What comes? What comes to your mind? Okay, great. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's there's no right or wrong answers, but everything what you've shared is uh, is so in line with the word passion, right? Uh, Sincerity, strong desire, zeal, like John mentioned, um, powerful or compelling uh, emotion, right? But uh, the root uh, word for passion um, for, it comes from the Latin word. It simply means long suffering. <laughs> it's so different, so uh, such such contrast, isn't it? Uh, long suffering, right? The last week of Jesus' life, the week uh, that builds up to the cross, is known as the Passion Week. Right? It, means, uh, it talks about his long suffering that he had to endure. Right? Um, and so, and that's what that's what compassion is all about. Right? Um, and you see that Jesus. Uh, keeps saying that you know he was moved with compassion when he saw the multitudes in Matthew nine. Uh, he was moved with compassion time and time and time again. Right? He was moved with compassion and healed the leper. He had compassion and he healed the blind man. Right? He was moved with compassion. Out of compassion, he delivered the demon possessed boy. Right? Um, right? Um, and so and then, like. Remember, those are that's those are all the norm. But then, yet yeah, there are certain scenarios, some scenarios in the Bible that's mentioned, but it doesn't seem like he had any compassion. It, it seems like that, but yet he healed. Right? A couple of those examples, uh, for example, uh, here Jesus was angered and grieved with the people in the house. And he still proceeded to heal the paralyzed man. Okay, let's actually go to Mark chapter three. Let's see, uh, you know, it's uh, quite interesting. Mark chapter three, verse one to five. Okay, Mark chapter three, verse one to five. It says, another time he went into the synagogue. So that's where he is. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. 
Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his man was completely, and his hand was completely restored. Okay, so that's just one of the examples. Now, he was, he still had compassion towards the man, but then he was not in that zone or in that, in that happy mood, I guess, because of the people around him. Right, because they were God. Jesus knew that what their intentions were. That He was being watched. Okay, let's see what He's gonna do now. Um, you know, um, another scenario is the conversation between Jesus and the Canaanite uh, woman. Right, it doesn't really uh, seem to be very compassionate. The whole dialogue doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, very compassionate. Um, but yet Jesus is moved uh, by the by the faith of the woman, and and the and, and her daughter is healed, right? So um, those are the exceptions. Uh, we see compassion is key, right? Um, and when it comes to us, right? I mean, uh, let's, okay, let's just look at these applications, and and you know, it says we must increase in compassion for the sick, hurting, and oppressed. Okay, uh, there is emotional suffering involved in the healing ministry. Okay. You see that it's emotional suffering. Okay, so compassion, passion simply means long suffering. Right, involved in the healing ministry as you feel compassion for the people who are sick and hurting. Okay, um, And here, when we come down here, it says, there will be times when you as a minister have no deep feeling of compassion. And yet God, because he is compassionate, uses you to bring healing to someone. Okay, there will be times. Okay, <clears throat> let's imagine uh, you have 50 people lined up for prayer, for healing. Okay, and you're the only guy, person standing there praying. You'll be full of zeal and compassion and all full, you know, uh, energetic. Let's say for the first 10 people. And then, and then there are four, there are 40 more in the line. Right? It's like, and you realize suddenly it's like, okay, you know, I don't think I have the energy. I, I need some Red Bull now, um, you know, to give me wings. Um, <laughs> but the, the, there will be times, right? We've got to be practical and realistic about it. Right? You're going to feel like, okay, you know, I just, I just don't seem to feel it. Um, but we continue to pray and release healing because we know that, it, one, it is God's will for them to be healed. And then because he is compassionate, right? Because he, too, he is full of compassion, he will use you to bring healing to someone. Amen. And so we see that Jesus, is, Jesus was moved with compassion time and time again. He was moved emotionally. We see him that he groaned and he wept. Uh, you know, as, when you read these uh, scriptures, uh, he, he wanted to see people being healed. Okay, so that's uh, what flowing in the compassion is all about. So uh, we've covered three principles uh, so far in this chapter. Okay, and we pause here. And uh, we we'll take a quick 10 minute break and we we'll come back and resume from there. Okay, I'll stop the recording now and uh, go for your break. Thanks, guys. I'll see you.